Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. The recent announcement that Ruth Messenger is stepping down from her position as president and CEO of the American Jewish World Service seemed to suggest that a long and outstanding career in public service is coming to an end, but not so. She will continue to serve as global ambassador for the organization, which is dedicated to promoting human rights and ending poverty in the developing world and where she's been since 1998. From social worker to New York City Council member to Manhattan Borough President to Democratic candidate for mayor to leading the American Jewish World Service, her career has spanned decades and has taken her almost everywhere. Today, we'll talk about her remarkable career, her most recent work, and where she plans to go from here. Welcome. Thank you, Cheryl. So why step down at this point in time? Well, I'd say there are three reasons. One is, actually a fourth reason is I am 75 years old, but that's not gonna stop me. Three reasons, I think 18 years is really a long tenure in an organization, and there's always an opportunity to bring in a fresh perspective. That's one. But two is I had the perfect successor. My executive vice president, who's been there for seven years, really helped me shape the last stage of the development of the organization, um, was, was I, in my judgment, ready to step up, and I didn't want the organization to lose him. So it just seemed like the right moment with the board to make this change. And then the last one, as you suggested, is that this is happening in a way that I can keep doing some work for the organization, which delights me. So what will you be doing as Global Ambassador? So I will be focusing in on two aspects of our work. One is the work we do with rabbis throughout America, getting them and their congregations to think about global human rights issues, to think way outside of issues and problems in their communities, issues and problems in the Jewish community, and to pay attention to the needs of today's poorest and most marginalized people. And I will be working with what seems to be a growing group of international human rights leaders who come at it from a faith base. So for example, the World Bank has put together 40 faith-based leaders, all different faiths, to work with the World Bank on ending extreme poverty. And it's a, an honor, but an exciting challenge to be the Jewish voice or one of the two Jewish voices on that panel. Okay. Now, when we spoke, and it was almost two years ago, you were coming off of some heavy involvement uh, in Darfur following the civil unrest and the genocide there, and in Haiti following the earthquake there. One doesn't hear a lot about those countries in the news uh, these days. Uh, are you still involved there? And sort of what's the conditions like on the ground? Um, okay, well, I'll respond. I will say first that you're absolutely right. You stop hearing about these countries much too quickly. American media, and I say that advisedly because BBC, some other European stations are different. Um, but American media goes through a phase They'll cover the tsunami, they'll cover an earthquake, and then they drop it. And it's, it's, I think, some of the limits on journalism that are imposed by the journalism business. But I also think it's sort of American minds move Short too attention quickly. Span, yes. right. So um, let's take the examples. Um, in Haiti, yes, we're definitely still working there. That's partly because it's our understanding and our experience that after a disaster like that earthquake in a really poor country like Haiti, the rebuilding takes forever. There are always going to be challenges. Haiti, they're exacerbated by a very, very weak government. And actually, in a funny way, they're exacerbated by a rising interest on the part of what I'm loosely going to describe as corporate America, thinking, oh, maybe this is a good place to go put factories that pay low wages. Oh, let's go and take people's land and tur turn it into tourist hotels. So we work with the people on the ground who are still trying to rebuild after the earthquake, but quite frankly, they're also trying to develop their country for themselves. Right, right. Um, so that would be Haiti. Now, Darfur, we don't work directly. The situation in Sudan and South Sudan continues to be terrible. We are actually focusing now on some other places where there's been really serious ethnic cleansing that has not even come to that same level of public attention. And I would cite most particularly Burma, where the Muslim population in this Buddhist country, the Rohingya, um, are 
unbelievably oppressed and hurt by um, their own government, even as it's emerging from the worst levels of military dictatorship toward a pseudo-democracy, there's still this huge amount of dangerous ethnic rivalry and abuse. And so that's a country that's getting more attention from us. Okay. Let's talk about some of the work that some of the initiatives and some of the work that your organization has done since 2014. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to go by general category sure. and you can just sort of tell me. Um, one of your areas has always been, or has been for some time, support for women and girls. What are you doing? What's going on in So I would, I would name two things. One is the ongoing work that we do to... Um, to help women empower themselves, rise into positions of more authority in their communities, and then sometimes in the government of their own country. I would cite particularly a huge piece of work that we're doing in India that we hope to do elsewhere in the world, which is to work with people on the ground who have decided to oppose early in child marriage. So again, because of the way we work as an organization, we don't go tell people what to do. We find, and in India, we're doing this in five states in India, we found about 40 different groups that might be teaching young girls and boys about human rights. They might be saying women and girls actually have a right to stay in school, to seek their own employment. So yes, part of the problem is that half the country is being in India, half the girls in the country are being married off before the age of 18 many of them against their will. But it's not really, Cheryl, just the age of marriage. It's the agency for those young women. Do mm -hmm. they have control over their own right. lives? And that's a, we have a fortunate to have a donor whose focus, focused interest is on that issue. And you support the organizations that are working. We support local. grassroots organizations. And I would say we're doing more and more to help them advocate for change with their own government and to build social movements that we know from America are one of the ways you make social change. Mm -hmm. Now, workers' rights issues. Well, I will be going in about three weeks to Cambodia where we work with a group that has helped young women who have to leave, who, in order to work, leave their homes, go to the towns where there are uh, factories, clothing factories, um, live, I've been there, in a room that's, let's say, 10 feet by 10 feet. Four young women get to roll out a mattress at night. And those um, young women, I believe the number is, have just raised their monthly wage to $128 a month. And they are still fighting for higher wages and better working conditions. Um, and I noticed uh, from your website um, and I'm, I've forgotten which country specifically, but your organization supports the rights of female sex workers. Tell me about that. Well, let's be clear, first of all, because this is how we get into the debate. We are opposed to trafficking of anybody. That is particularly, of course, of children. Everyone knows those horrible stories. But there are places around the world where women have organized and make the decision that the best thing they can do to make money for themselves and their families is to sell their bodies. And those women form organizations in order to protect their own health, in order to protect them from assaults by local police. And they see themselves as organizations of sex workers. And we are one of the organizations that helps some of those groups. Okay. Um, to protect their rights and see that they're... Protect their rights, um, you know, and, and, and make sure that should they run into a problem, that they have a place to go that isn't a local corrupt police officer right. who will then take further advantage of them. Right. Um, you have obviously been involved in responding to natural disasters. Anything happened in the, in the last couple of years? Oh, yeah. Um, there was a serious typhoon in the Philippines where we've continued to work, and then the earthquake in Nepal. And so we've been on the ground there for, I guess it's now close to a year. Um, and it's, again, it's, we try to not do the most obvious frontline relief. We try, when we come in as a, to help people, we look for the people who are still being marginalized. So in Nepal, for example, the so-called Dalit, the people who are the quote-unquote untouchable caste, right. 
weren't getting any help, even though their home was just as seriously destroyed as, as somebody else. So we look for the organizations that are helping those people. And then we look for the people in a community, many of them in Nepal, who are saying, basically, let's build back better. Let's try to claim some rights. Let's try to create housing that won't come down to the next earthquake. Right. And we do that kind of work. So we'll be in Nepal for at least another year doing that work. Response to medical crises. I know you were involved in the uh, Ebola outbreak in Liberia. So that's one of our best stories, I think, for helping people understand how we work. Ebola hit three countries, uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and, and Liberia. Liberia was the one where we had a set of contacts and connections, grassroots partner organizations. None of them was doing public health. But we said to them, OK, you clearly aren't going to be organizing on behalf of girls' rights. You clearly aren't going to be defending local farmers right now. Would you be willing to work with our support to do basic community public health education to try to stem the spread of the virus. And many of our groups said yes. And I want to say it was a very, very, for me, rewarding experience because, of course, everybody was concerned. We had governors in New York and New Jersey making somewhat crazy decisions about Ebola volunteers. But imagine living in a country where suddenly everyone is getting sick and dying. And the solution arrives in the form of white men in moon suits telling you what to do. And not just telling you, you know, wash your food better, but telling you, you can't follow your burial rights. You can't do this, you can't do that. They were, the information was accurate, but there was, it was all lost in, in translation. And so our groups that we supported basically went door to door in communities mm -hmm. and said to people, this is the virus. This is how you recognize when it's coming. This is what you do to protect your families. And this is what you must do if you want to stop the spread. And right now, in all three countries, it looks like we've gone past this epidemic. And now we have to think about strengthening their health infrastructures for the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, another area, uh, and this may be a, a, a recent one, support for LGBTs, lesbian, gays, bisexual, and transgender. You got it all. So this is really um, an interesting moment in time. I would say it's not new for at least the last decade when we were working in a country, again, with this focus on individual human rights. We've looked for LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender organizations. Now imagine organizing a group of lesbians in Uganda where a same-sex relationship is punishable by imprisonment, and the government is trying to make it punishable by death. So these organizations are very small at first, and basically, to be honest with you, nobody from outside was supporting them. So we have developed, I think in 14 of the 19 countries where we work, we now support 47 different LGBT organizations. We are one of the largest US funders of global LGBT work. And, and you've been doing that for a while. Yeah, okay. and that's people fighting for their rights, fighting to be sure that, um, that they get equal treatment, and sometimes fighting very specifically to change the law. So in Uganda, we supported the lawyer and the legal organization that took the, after Museveni signed the bill, this group took him to court, not on a big human rights platform, but just on the fact that procedures weren't followed. And the Uganda court supported our lawyer. Mm -hmm. So the bill has been thrown out. Everybody expects it to be reintroduced and is continuing to organize to see if it's possible to prevent that. But meanwhile... For now, it's out. It's out. Okay. No death penalty. Uh, and finally, the area of poverty and hunger. I gather that um, you, your group was instrumental in getting President Obama to sign a provision in the U.S. Farm Bill that does something differently with, with regard to providing food. You might be the most knowledgeable person about our work that I've met in the last <laughs> five years. So the good news is I think so far I can rise to the test, but this is good. This is very exciting. For reasons that literally go back to the 1950s, the United States Farm Bill had all these provisions about food in the case of international disasters. The provisions were written to support American farmers and American shippers. Now, there, American farmers have lots of needs. I suppose American shipping companies have some needs. But that's not the purpose of international aid money. So the change in the law says that in any international disaster, 
the United States can spend up to 45% of the money that it's allocating to buy emergency food locally, which means it gets there faster, it's much cheaper, but more importantly, it invests resources in local farmers instead of dumping American surplus food right. and putting local farmers out of business. Right, right. Uh, any new areas that you've gone to that I haven't mentioned? The only thing that you haven't mentioned that's sort of related to some of what you asked about is there's a growing interest on the part of multinational corporations in doing their thing on land that other people think they own. So going into Kenya and deciding to start drilling to see if there's mineral resources. Right. Going into Burma and flooding out a town because you want to build a hydroelectric dam to bring power, not even to the people who live there, but to another city. So this whole issue is actually called land grabbing. Right. And we are working with groups in a great many countries that are fighting to say that people should be able to hold on to their smallholder farm areas and or that they have a right to full informed consent before any of their land is used by an outside interest. Right. Okay. We're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with more with Ruth Messenger, president of the American Jewish World Service, after the following message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy at the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Ruth Messenger, president of the American Jewish World Service. Does there ever come a time when, um, as an organization, you feel you've done as much as you can uh, in a particular area, on a particular issue, and that you're now going to leave it to the residents to take over? Sure. On a particular issue, we Basically, I would say our tenure with an organization is most often five, six, seven years, at which point we'll at least be talking to them about what they might do to continue on their own. And sometimes what we do is help connect them to other funders. Mm -hmm. So yes, that happens. Um, we have focused in on the 19 countries where we work in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And those are countries where we want to continue to have a footprint and try to help what may be 20 or 30 different organizations in the country work on making social change for the long haul. Have your priorities shifted since you've been there or do they remain pretty much the same? Well, that's a good question. I would say that they've focused and deepened. We've been much more explicit that we're a human rights organization. So not relief, as I said before, and not just relief and development, but human rights. So yes, you can help um, a group of farmers hold on to their land you can get them legal support and win a case. But then think of what has to happen. That country has to either recognize the legal decision or change its laws. Or, and to do that, you sometimes have to help people build a larger social movement. But we've done a much better job in the last five years of defining ourselves as a human rights organization, identifying those 19 countries and the major thematic areas in which we work, which you covered very nicely before. Last year, um, your organization made some cutbacks in its domestic political advocacy program, I gather, for lack of sufficient contributions. How will that affect um, that part of your mission? And what are some of the policies that you lobby for? Okay, so it was actually a little different than what you said okay. because we were able... Yes, it was a question of funding, but we were able to keep our Washington office. So we have a policy advocacy office in Washington. It secured that win in the Farm Bill. It secured, with many other groups, the appointment, the first ever special envoy, special ambassador for LGBT issues in the U.S. State Department. Where we had to cut back a little bit, Cheryl, was we were beginning to employ local organizers to go to some of our petition signers to go to some of our check writers and say, could we organize you to come visit your member of Congress? Can we organize you to go do some education of local elected officials? The work that we did there was quite successful, but it was clear that it was going to be a very costly enterprise. And so we felt better to strengthen the Washington office and to increasingly use our website, which you've been on, ajws.org, and social media 
to tell people how to work with us to promote social change. Now, did you have a why when you took over? Did you have a Washington office at that time? No, when I took over, the organization was very small. It was a $2.8 million organization. It had about 13 staff people, and it was just based in New York. And gradually, we've grown, the Washington office being small but mighty, but very significant for its work on policy. And we have branch offices in L.A., San Francisco, and Chicago. Oh. So we're now a $60 million organization with about 120 staff people in America and overseas. What accomplishments are you most proud of and what have been your biggest disappointments, sources of frustration? Well, at American Jewish World Service, what I'm most proud of is actually what I just said. We've grown the organization. We've grown an increasing awareness on the part of a variety of American publics about global issues, about the importance of human rights, about the importance of recognizing that every person in the world has a right to determine or to envision his or her own future and that our job is to work with them toward that end. And I love that we've grown and I love that we've narrowed our focus so that we can do even more good work. Look, career-wise, I'm very lucky. I had 20 wonderful years in New York City politics, lots of accomplishments along the way, lost a big election, and immediately found a job that's been immensely satisfying. So that plus three children, eight grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren is all very satisfying. Pretty good record. <laughs> in the broad field of international humanitarian work, um, and you have a big pers broad perspective on that now. What's being, what's being done right and who's doing it right? Okay, so for me what's being done right, which we do obviously and some other people do, but it's, it's just always recognizing the people at the bottom. Like it's great that the United States government does international aid. Very often I feel we should do more of it. But a lot of U.S. aid is given for geopolitical reasons. And a lot of it goes from one government to another government. And it may make some difference in that country, but it doesn't help those smallholder farmers. It doesn't help that indigenous group. So I would like to see more international aid recognize that change does come from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. um, you spent a lot of time, as you said, in New York City politics. Um, how are we doing, to, <laughs> to paraphrase Mayor Koch, how are we doing now? How are we doing? Well, look, the most amazing thing about New York City is it just keeps being New York City. It's an amazingly diverse city. It's constantly developing and redeveloping. I'm staggered by some of what's happened outside of Manhattan to grow huge communities. Um, I feel like there have been some serious good initiatives in the new administration. I don't yet seeing them be coming fully to fruition other than the universal pre-K, which I think was a huge step forward that will pay off over time. But there's more to do. The homeless issue, which has dogged mayors and homeless advo advocates for the homeless, it's still, is, is, it, is it solvable? Well, it is, but not, it goes right back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of this program, not by people, whether they're in government or the person on the street who's looking for a quick fix. I mean, yeah. these are issues that have to do with benefits. They have to do with the fit or lack of fit between people's training and their employment opportunities. Sometimes on employment opportunities, they have to do with which kind of businesses is New York City trying to attract, and is it providing a path to work in those businesses. And then, of course, is the big issue which this administration is trying to find an answer to, and that is how do you provide more affordable housing? Right. How do you induce developers to build housing that people can afford? And the one thing you've got to understand about that is even if you find the perfect way, it takes a long time yeah. to find the sites, to build the housing. to So it's not going to get solved quickly. Right. I think the concern about conditions in the shelter is, is shelters is overdue. Because, you know, who has allowed the shelters to get to be so bad? You know, why aren't they managed better? When I think about your, your long career in public service, I think of a group of New York women uh, who, you know, came along around the same time, um, who carved out roles in public service, first in New York, and then started to paint on a broader canvas. Carol Bellamy, 
who was president of city council, then with the Peace Corps, UNICEF, World Learning, Elizabeth Holtzman, an attorney in New York City Comptroller, Brooklyn District Attorney, then the House of Representatives, Donna Shalala, who was president of Hunter College, became Secretary of Health and Human Services, president of University of Miami, Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, civil rights attorney who became head of the EEOC and now represents Washington in the House of uh, Washington, D.C. in the House of Representatives. Do you guys ever get together and talk about your experiences and share stories? And Well, the whole group doesn't get together. I see Liz Holtzman most often because she and I were actually in the same class in college. But I see Carol Bellamy because, as you noted, she went to do international development. Right. UNICEF, World Learning. I'm actually right. um, on one of the advisory committees of World Learning. Um, so we, we have intersected and interacted with each other from time to time. And Donna, of course, has just come back to New York City as the president of the Clinton Foundation. Okay. So I would say the amazing thing is, um, um, Eleanor, I see occasionally in Washington, but the amazing thing is it's a group of people that have stayed at least in the public service business, whether local or global, to, the, to a great extent possible, um, and we at least connect with each other, but not all together, although you could have us all here. And <laughs> right, see right. What that, would would be, that would be a fun show. Now, did, what did you major in in Radcliffe? Um, um, government. Okay, and then you got a master's in social work. Uh, did you ever imagine when you were getting those degrees that you'd be doing what you've been doing, or was that your dream to no, do what you've been doing? I didn't doing? imagine any of these things whatsoever. I majored in government because it was a convenient major and I was sort of interested in current events and public affairs. And when I went to social work school, I imagined that I was going to become a caseworker. Okay. So my life has done nothing but take strange turns and I've loved every one of them. And you've exceeded your expectations, I would imagine. Yes. Well, we're out of time. I want to thank Ruth Messenger, president of the American Jewish World Service, for joining me. For more information about this organization, you can go to ajws.org for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.